Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church in Eugene. We're empowered by love. We transform ourselves and serve our world. My name is Sharon Roberts, and my pronouns are she, her. With me today is our minister, the Reverend Jen Young Sun Ru, collaborative pianist Suzanne Giordano, vocalist Izzy Kreka and Bob Sorens, faith formation teacher Kara Kaiser, interim director of faith formation for children and youth Sarah Sauter, and working behind the scenes technical communications coordinator Kat Johnson. Today, we gather in full community as our younger members will remain with us during the service. We invite our younger members to say hi in the chat now. We gather in worship to find meaning and to live more deeply. Worship creates connections within, among, and beyond us, calling us to our better selves, calling us to live with wisdom and compassion. Whoever you are, whomever you love, whatever your image of the holy, we're glad you're here. If you're visiting us today, we'd love to hear from you. And we invite you to fill out the visitor form as you feel called to do so. The link is being dropped into the chat now. Really appreciate you uh, promoting the trunk or treat and hope to see everybody out there. Good morning, good Sunday morning, everyone. My name is Jen Young Sun Ru, and I prefer the pronouns she and her. I serve this congregation as its settled minister, and I'm very happy to be with you all. Today is our first full community worship service of the new year. And full community worship is where all ages come to celebrate life and give thanks for all of its blessings. Don't forget that this afternoon in the church parking lot, Molly Mae Culligan and I will be blessing your animal friends starting at one o'clock. So there isn't a program, just come whenever you can, leave whenever you want to. We'll start wrapping up around a quarter till two. There's also going to be a blessing cam right there, streaming the live event on Zoom. You can find that link on the church calendar on the website or in the weekly connections that you got last Wednesday. And remember, the governor's outdoor mask mandate for large groups still stands, so we'll mask up. This morning, we gather to reflect on our relationship with the animals that we share this earth with. And the reason that we do blessing of the animals in October is because the feast day of St. Francis falls on this month. St. Francis, as many of you know, was a very kindly, gentle monk who lived with animals and the earth. He said, all creatures are created from the same heartbeat of God. Not to hurt them is our first duty, but to stop there is not enough. We have a higher mission to be of service to them whenever they require it. We love our animals so much, don't we? Sometimes we let them sleep in our bed and we give them kisses. We treat them like members of our family. And sometimes we don't treat them very well. We throw trash into the water and the fish can't breathe. We build roads that make it hard for turtles to get back to their ponds. We spill oil into the waters and ducks get that sticky stuff all over their feathers. We put too many chickens in one building and they can hardly move. Our relationship with the Earth's non-human creatures is, well, it's kind of complicated. So come. Let us bless the animals and consider what we can do to make life better for all of us. Come, let us worship together. Victoria will lead us in our chalice lighting. Victoria? We light this chalice, spark of the original fire of creation in honor of the animal realm. 
spurred and hoofed, two legged, four legged, many legged, fanged and clawed, gentle and fierce, wild and tame. May rem we remember that all animals are our relatives. We are all made of the same star stuff and all share a common destiny. Thank you, Sarah. That was a really cute story. You know, one of the first really important things we learn when we're young, and sometimes when we're very young, is that everything that lives also dies. The bright green leaf that we saw this summer on the tree is turning yellow now and orange and brown. And then it falls to the ground gently. With enough time, that leaf becomes dirt, giving life to new baby trees. And animals die too. Bumblebees and spiders, wild mice and birds, and even our own family pets. Have you ever had a pet that died? Well, when I was about eight or nine years old, we had a little black and white dog named Daisy. And I loved her so much. One day, she got into some poison that the neighbors had put on their lawn. And she died a couple of days later. It was the first time I had ever experienced losing someone I loved. I remember feeling sad, but you know what? I also remember that feeling didn't last forever. Eventually, I just remember how cute Daisy was and how much fun we had together. It really does help to tell stories and just to remember them with other people. We're going to turn on the chat now. And so if you want to type in the name of your beloved animal friend that you have loved and lost. And while you're doing that, Bob will play a little bit of music. Thank you so much for sharing all of those remembrances. You can continue to um, add to the chat as we go along in our service. I've noticed that some of these losses are from years past and some are quite recent. Someone lost their pet just on Thursday. So our sympathies and our compassion go out to all those who are remembering their loved ones. Our reading today is adapted from the poem for a five-year-old by Fleur Adcock. A snail is climbing up the windowsill into your room after a night of rain. You call me in to see, and I explain, it would be unkind to leave it there. It might crawl to the floor. We must take care that no one squashes it. You understand and carry it outside with careful hand to eat a daffodil. I see then, that a kind of faith prevails. Your gentleness is molded still by words from me who have trapped mice and shot wild birds. From me who betrayed your closest relatives and who pervade the harshest kind of truth to many another. But that is how things are. I am your mother and we are kind to snails. Moved into my apartment this summer, the ants were my welcoming committee. There were so many eager to greet me. Now, even though I had not left out any food or drink for the party, they all came anyway. But with a little help from Borax, I got rid of every last one but not with some feelings, not without having some feelings about it, because you know what? Ants are amazing. 
Anyone who has ever watched a BBC Earth episode about them knows exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, they farm, they manage livestock, they wage war, they build and protect their borders, they cooperate as one being. They're incredible. And I know that I have more power than the ant. Does that mean my life is more valuable? And how does one even measure that kind of value? In so many ways, our relationship with animals as is an important part of what it means to be a human being. Our bond goes back millions and millions of years to the very beginning of human time. We could not have grown or progressed as quickly as we did without using animals for fur, for skin, for food, for tools, for fire. Now, I don't have any doubt that our earliest ancestors probably all also became friends with some of the animals. No doubt that they might have looked into the eyes of a dog and wondered, how are we the same? But mostly, we use them for our own benefit. And our brains grew, right? We changed, we adapted, we learned how to use and make more and better tools. We got better at using animals. We learned how to make them bigger and faster and meatier. Our appetite for them kept growing and keeps growing. We started using them for entertainment and sport for fighting and racing. We use them for scientific experiments. And that science has saved so many human lives and allowed us to evolve to this point where we are here in the year 2021. The great humanitarian and scientist, Dr. Albert Schweitzer, who also happened to be a Unitarian, held deep reverence for all forms of life. As a scientist, he felt the twinge of contradiction as he thought about sacrificing one life to save another, usually higher up on the food chain. Once, when he was in the jungle, and Dr. Schweitzer was often in the jungle. He found some young boys abusing an eagle that they had accidentally caught in one of their nets. Dr. Schweitzer then bought the injured eagle from them so that he could save them. He took the eagle home, but now he had to either sacrifice some small fish so that the eagle could live, or he could let the eagle starve to death. We take one form of life to save another. We make decisions to either squash the bug or carry it outside. We decide what we're going to have for dinner. For the entire time that humans have existed on this earth, we have used animals for our good so that we could survive and then thrive and then dominate this planet. And now that we have proliferated and profited by our use of animals and filled almost every nook and cranny of this planet, more and more of us are returning those gifts by being a blessing to the animals. More of us are thinking about ways that we can be of service to them, planting gardens where bees and birds and other pollinators can rest and eat and be well. We plant hedgerows so that furry creatures can run really fast without being seen. We volunteer at shelters and care for baby birds that fall out of the nest. We practice humane farming and veganism, or at least we're trying to eat less meat. We build little ladders for ducks and turtles and we're finally picking up the mass of garbage in our oceans. Now that doesn't mean that we have eliminated animal suffering, not by a long shot. Abuse, 
and cruelty, exploitation, intensive farming still go on every single day on this planet. Most devastating of all, human decisions and human actions are destroying the homes of thousands of species. Climate change is the biggest concern of our time. It is the issue that brings together all of the passionate justice makers of our day, animal rights activists, economic and racial justice crusaders, human rights champions, all of us working together. That's the only way we're going to make it. You know, if we think about all of the broken, messed up places in our world, we can become overwhelmed and panic ourselves to the point of complete inaction. But what if we followed the example of that young child throwing starfish one by one into the ocean? Then we can make a difference. You know that story? A fierce storm had stranded hundreds of starfish on the beach. The next morning, a young child starts picking them up one by one and throwing them back into the ocean. Another person comes by and says to the child, you know, that's a waste of time. You know, you can't save them all. What's the use? The child picks up another starfish and answers confidently, I can save this one. There's always one more thing that we can do, and it can, be, it can be quite small, but rest assured that it does matter. I wonder how many things that you can list that humans do to help animals. I bet if you really, really tried, you could come up with a hundred things that people do to help animals. You think you can do it? When you're done with your list, pick one that you and your family have never done and see if you can do that. Maybe I should give you a deadline. Maybe you could do that by Halloween. Let's see how many of you can have a list of 100 and then pick one and do that. You got two weeks. <laughs> Here in this spiritual community, we revere all life. We know that we can't save everybody. We can't save every being. We know that we can't fix everything that is broken. But we know that we can do this one thing. We can come together on a Sunday morning to feel, to sing, to think, to wonder, to make art. And then tomorrow, we can do one more thing. May it be so. Amen. Hi, my name is Izzy Kreka, and I'm your office administrator, and I sing with you on Sundays. A little over a year ago, during the summer of 2020, when my partner and I were feeling the loss of socializing really hit us, um, like many others, we decided to help fill the gap with a furry friend. Uh, and on September 20th, 2020, we got a kitten. Our cat named Bento brought much levity to our little apartment on 6th Street. She relentlessly dove into any and all paper bags that entered the house, and she still does. And she wiggled her way into all the forbidden places and was a terror and a joy, as any kitten has the right to be. Just before Thanksgiving, I took Bento in for a round of shots and a checkup, and she seemed a little off after the visit, enough so that we went back the next day. Just watch her, they said. And watch I did. The day after Thanksgiving, it was clear she wasn't doing better. Um, we had been back to the vet twice, and now was feeling pretty sure we were looking at something other than a vaccine reaction. She had mostly stopped eating and was barely drinking water and was puking up little bits of clear liquid and foamy spit. We said yes to x-rays um, that showed she has an intestinal obstruction, my four-month-old kitten who had barely started her life. At that point, my partner Austin and I had exactly $3,000 in our emergency fund. We had two choices. We could go in for surgery right away or wait it out to try to get things moving. We went for the second option and left her with the vet for the day. We went home to cry 
and consider our options. Then we returned in the evening, nothing had changed and we had almost a thousand dollar bill. We went home with our sick little kitty and I cried some more. We can't afford this. We can't afford this, said my brain on repeat. Only interrupted by, but she's such a baby. We have to give her a chance. That night, I, I made the GoFundMe. I asked for help. Do you think that's okay? I asked my boyfriend. Yeah. I don't think it can hurt, he said. It's hard to accept that we have needs we cannot meet alone. Asking for help feels easier when it's asking for a little time or a meal or a ride. But to ask for money? That feels like admitting failure. When I so strongly felt that I had failed this little animal already. And at the same time, that surgery was going to cost our entire stuff hits the fan fund in the middle of a pandemic. We were fully employed and in good physical health, but we could not spend our savings down to nothing. We had been and maybe again would be in worse financial situations. We couldn't do it alone. So I made the GoFundMe, I shared the story, and our need was answered in an absolutely shocking and awe-inspiring way. You were the community I needed when I didn't even know I could ask. I first reached out to the UUCE Facebook community group asking for healing thoughts and, and well wishes for my little friend. Um, I not only received those, but before even asking, I received direct financial support. Um, just a little bit of money through Venmo, <laughs> which a year later still leaves me teary. Um, that act gave me permission I didn't know I was waiting for. To provide an avenue for those who knew that we were hurting to help save Vento. The surgery was long and complex due to the way her intestines had shifted. She had about two weeks of critical recovery and by the end of the first week, she was feeling good enough to be well and truly angered by her remaining time in confinement. <laughs> I will always be awestruck by the way UUCE showed up, not only financially, which was impactful to say the least, but also emotionally and materially. We were, we were able to borrow a log, large dog crate for her recovery space. And when nights and nights of jailed kitten tears were almost too much to bear, our treasurer offered to take her for a night or two. Lucky for her, the doctor gave Bento parole before we had to take her up on the offer. I was also granted flexibility in my work during that time when I couldn't leave her alone. Those things, the offers, the generosity, and your way of showing up meant so very much to me. I'm not sure I can ever thank you enough. So I put that love right into my fully recovered, totally rambunctious little cat and into my work here at UUC. Thank you. That was gorgeous. For all that has been spoken, and for all the joys and sorrows held in the silent sanctuaries of our hearts, we give thanks. For we know that we cannot have one without the other, and open to all that we receive, we experience the fullness of life. Dr. Jane Goodall is someone we often think about when we are considering the animal-human relationship she wrote a lovely prayer for world peace, and I'll share some of it with you today. O oh, love eternal, we give thanks for your presence among us, for companions gone before and friends still to come, for the innocence of animals and the wonder of children, in sympathy of friends, in times of trouble, and for the courage to believe that even when we feel most separate, we are not alone, for we remain related to all that is, as parts within the whole, connected to each other and to the great mystery of life. Amen. 
we extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And now go forth into this day and go forth into this brand new week, remembering that you too are a creature upon this earth, no greater or smaller than any other, all equally beloved, equally blessed, equally worthy. Go in peace, everyone.